Good morning, everyone. We're uh, about to begin, and uh, I'm Stephen Ward, the uh, director of the Centre for Journalism Ethics, and I want to uh, call on Dean Gary Sander for, uh, Dean of the College of Letters, of, of Letters and Science, to uh, say a few uh, welcoming words to you. Dean? Thanks, Stephen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning and welcome you to this uh, conference on ethics and journalism, and this time focusing on elections. Uh, this is a very exciting election season in Wisconsin. Not only are we looking forward to the November elections, but we have some recall elections coming up soon. Uh, so it's really been very interesting to uh, follow the politics of the state over the past uh, year or so, and uh, we're looking forward to what happens uh, this year. Uh, this is a, a wonderful conference. I was looking through the lineup of speakers and panels that uh, you're going to hear from and, and be a part of, and it looks like just a, another fascinating conference. Uh, Stephen has been very successful since we lured him away from Canada in organizing the Center for Journalism Ethics and in uh, bringing together a number of interesting conferences and other events that uh, he's planned and, and, and uh, put on, so we're very pleased with what, with what he's been able to accomplish. So uh, you are the early risers, the people who got here early <laughs> in the morning. Steve and I were talking, uh, 845 is early for academics, so uh, you, should be, you should be proud of yourselves for being here. So I hope you have a wonderful conference and enjoy your time on our campus. Thank you very much. Yes, we do expect a large crowd here, but it is early. But I'm going to kick off uh, the conference with a few comments before we go to our, our very first panel. Uh, first of all, um, I want to welcome you to the fourth annual Journalism Ethics Conference. Uh, elections, uh, ethics and elections, media, money, and power. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here as director and to, and to listen to the conversation and try to direct some of the day's uh, activities. First of all, uh, the aim of our center, this conference just fills right, uh, falls right into its aim, which is to advance standards of journalism uh, through research, teaching, professional application, and public outreach. And uh, I see this conference as fulfilling almost all of those tasks. And the conference has been growing bigger and better every year, uh, and I look forward to the, uh, to the years to come. I think we couldn't pick a more timely topic if you just pick up the New York Times or any newspaper today, you'll three, see three stories directly relevant to our conference today. An appeals court in San Francisco uh, uh, um, comes down with a ruling on whether political advertising should be allowed on public TV. Uh, we have a lead story in the New York Times on money in the election, saying it's going to be the most moneyed election campaign ever. No surprise there. Uh, but on inside the New York Times, you'll find Santorum complaining that he was outmoneyed by uh, Mitt Romney. So all of these issues are in the paper every day, and so we, I think we're going to have a great uh, we're going to have a great discussion. Finally, I think the, uh, the the overall reason why we picked this topic, other than the obvious one that it's a it's a presidential election year, is that I think there's a larger question and worry at the back of my mind when I picked this topic and. We come to discuss journalism ethics, we often come at, from it from an idealistic point of view and we say, well, the ultimate function of a democratic press is to inform the electorate and therefore they can make very smart choices when it comes to the primary electoral uh, activity of a citizen almost, which is to vote. Uh, and in that way, uh, I wonder whether that ideal still stands. Uh, in an age of partisan and growing partisan media, an age of uh, misinformation on the internet, of manipulation by political advertising, and a whole host of other new developments. So on the dark side, you can worry about elections and money and power. Uh, on the more positive side, we have an enormous range of new tools, communication tools, that surely has the potential, surely has the potential to be used in positive ways to, uh, to spur civic engagement and communication. And it's up to us to use those tools in the, in the right manner for the benefit of democracy. So that was sort of the background uh, on this, uh, for this conference. The structure of the conference is uh, a little different from before. We're going to start with the panels. We have two panels, one on fact-checking, which uh, Professor Wells will uh, moderate. And then we have a, a break, and then we have another one on uh, political advertising, chaired by Devon Shaw. And uh, then we're going to have 
we're going to rearrange the room in here, uh, and we're going to have lunch, and a, a very uh, looking forward to the keynote address uh, by Mr. Tom uh, Rosensteel. And then we're going to, after lunch, we're going to go into a workshop sessions. If you look in your program, it's all there. There's going to be three different sessions. One here with Katie Culver and her friends talking about social media and elections. And there's going to be two other rooms, smaller ones. In one room, uh, Professor Lee Wilkins, which you'll get to know uh, as the day progresses, will talk about some practical advice on covering political ads and so on. Uh, and then in another room, Bill Leaders, a well-known journalistic figure here, uh, now with the Center for uh, Investigative Journalism, will hold a session on how to follow the money, how to follow the election money. So the intent of the work uh, these, these workshop-like uh, meetings is to probe more deeper and practically into the issues raised by the panels. After that, we're going to conclude uh, the session with a tribute to Anthony Shadid, which I hope you all will stay around for. Uh, we'll have people speaking, rec uh, reflecting on his life, people who know him very well. We'll also have a video, and we will present the first Anthony Shadid uh, Award for Journalism Ethics. I also, at this time, at, at this time I, I really need to uh, formally thank the many sponsors that have helped us with this, including, uh, including uh, generous support from the IVU Foundation, the Ethics and Excellence Journalism Foundation, Herman Bauman and Green Line St uh, Strategies, uh, the Wisconsin Newspaper Association, uh, WISC TV, the Investigative News Network, American Family Insurance, Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the School of, Mass, uh, School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Uh, and uh, there is also some private support, such as from uh, Pepe O'Neill. I hope I haven't missed anyone. If I have, I will come back and, and do it. So I think this is all I have to say, except to point out to you uh, that a lot of people are involved in making this a multi-media uh, uh, conference. We have, as we had last year, Katie Culver, and, and with the assistance, hi, Katie, uh, Joshua uh, Liebenthal, uh, Thal, uh, back there directing students who are holding a social media page, which means a blog uh, where people can comment, uh, a Twitter feed where we'll have comments. And we'll be able to take these comments from cyberspace, and Katie's going to pick a few good questions and, let the, and throw it at the panelists and see how they can handle it. And it, it, this allows us to uh, it involve the students. In addition, we, will have, we have students here who will be covering the events as journalists and writing up reports on all of this. So it's, uh, I just want to warn everybody that this is all on the record, folks. Uh, it's videotaped right now. People are going to tweet everything you say. Uh, and in that sense, we will then take the video and post it on our website. Uh, and so it will be accessible to uh, anyone who wants to have access to uh, that, these conversations in the years ahead. So I think I've said enough to, to start it going. Um, I'm really happy that you've come here, and I want to thank all the uh, participants who have come from far and wide to join us today. So I think we're ready to start with the first panel with uh, Professor Wells, so I'd ask him and his panelists uh, to come up, or is, is there one other thing? We're still waiting for one panelist, so let's just relax for a few minutes. Okay, we'll take a first uh, break until uh, a missing panelist shows up. Sorry about that. Oh, <laughs> he just showed up. <laughs>
Okay. Okay, good morning. Um, I'm really pleased to be uh, moderating this panel on fact-checking this morning. Um, first, I want to begin actually by introducing my uh, discussants, and then I'll have a couple of things to say before we begin the panel. Uh, but to my immediate right is Bill Adair. Uh, Bill is the editor of PolitiFact, which won the Pulitzer Prize for national reporting in 2009. He also has a long history as a journalist prior to his position at Political Fact. Uh, serves, um, he, well, he currently serves as the Washington Bureau Chief for the Tampa Bay Times, uh, which is formerly the St. Petersburg Times. To his right is Lucas Graves. Lucas is a PhD candidate at um, Columbia University in Communications, where his dissertation is on fact-checking in American journalism. And if you Google fact-checking, Lucas will already come up prominently as, as one of the top results, as one of the leaders and thinkers about um, what fact-checking is and how fact-checking works. Um, to his right is Lisa Graves. No relation? No right? relation. No relation. As far as we know. Um, <laughs> uh, who is the executive director of the Center for Media De Demo and Democracy, which is the publisher of PR Watch, Source Watch, Bankster USA, and AlecExposed.org. Um, she has a lot of experience um, working in and, and looking at the branches of government. She's been an expert witness before most of the branches of government and appeared on multiple um, and, and many channels of communication to discuss these topics. Um, so we just heard from uh, Stephen that the New York Times has suggested that 2012 will be the most moneyed election. Lucas and his co-author Tom Glazer have written that 2012 will also most likely be the most fact-checked election in American history. And what we're going to do is talk a little bit about what we mean by fact-checking. Um, because fact-checking is something that in some ways is kind of new. Mo much of the fact-checking that will be done in 2012 will be done by a new organism in the American media ecology. And these are organizations dedicated specifically to the process of fact-checking. Fact-checking the things especially that candidates and campaigns say, at least in the context of 2012. So these include some of the most prominent nonpartisan fact-checkers, such, such as factcheck.org and PolitiFact or the many fact-checking processes that traditional newspapers are, are implementing, as well as partisan fact-checkers on both sides. And what I want to observe just in these opening comments is that fact-checking emerges at a particular time and place in American journalism. And part of our task today, I think, is to, to describe not only what fact-checking is, but why it's emerged right now and what that tells us about the practices of American journalism and where American journalism is going. And I want to note three brief things before we be begin the panel about um, what, what that means. The first is that we, we're experiencing in American culture right now a deep skepticism and often hostility towards the press um, that goes along with a deep polarization in American political life. Um, and a number of important research programs are documenting now that we're polarized not only on the major issues of values, which are kind of the, the basis for deliberations about policy in, in the American democracy, but also about the facts of political life. And some of the most famous, of course, are differences over um, the, the facts of, or even scientific consensus on things like global warming and evolution. But really, our differences on facts extend through the gamut of American policy issues. So our, our polarization is one important fact that I think is part of the context of, of the fact-checking rise. The second is the, the treatment that American journalism has given to these facts. And some would say the failure, in some cases, of American journalism to deal adequately with the facts. And we'll hear about how fact-checking emerges out of frustrations with how American journalism deals with the facts or the misfacts that are presented by um, American politicians. The last point that we need to talk about is the emerging and increasingly digital media ecology and how fact-checking emerges in and operates within a media ecology that's increasingly digital and available to be shared across multiple platforms and people 
as the production and consumption of information lines are increasingly blurred. So with that uh, beginning, I'd like to begin by asking the question of what is fact-checking? What does fact-checking do and where does fact-checking come from in even very recent years in the American journalism landscape? And to begin answering that question, I'll invite Bill to comment. Well, uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I uh, was just, just drove in this morning from La Crosse. I spoke last night at the University of Wisconsin at La Crosse, and uh, it's uh, great to be here. And what a wonderful facility this is. This is really marvelous. Uh, I, uh, I guess we'll start by saying that fact-checking is necessary because American politics has become a battle of the talking point. Uh, both parties are hurling talking points at each other and of course, rarely do they actually talk. And increasingly, the media is just a vessel for those talking points. The parties concoct them, uh, focus group them when necessary, ask Frank Luntz what phrases they should use, and then they just start hurling them at each other on the floor of the House and Senate, on cable news channels, and in interviews with, with uh, other reporters. And so th it is an important time, I think, for the media to really step up and verify whether those talking points are accurate or not. Uh, in my case, um, uh, my uh, commitment to fact-checking began in 2004 uh, after a speech by Zell Miller at the Republican National Convention in New York where he criticized John Kerry for being weak on defense and for cutting defense programs and things when he was a U.S. Senator. And uh, uh, I heard that speech and thought, well, what he's saying isn't true. Um, and I know how Congress works. You know how Congress works. The Democrats vote for the Democratic bills. The Republicans vote for the Republican bills in part so they can give speeches like this criticizing each other for not supporting things when we know that that's not really what's going on. What we're talking about is just a, uh, a, a real partisan gamesmanship. And so, but I sat there, I was writing another story that night and I didn't write anything about Zell Miller's speech. Uh, and I'm not sure many others did, if anybody did. And this was a case where the media fell down on its job. And I think that has been the problem. I think the media has been too timid about doing fact-checking. There was a flurry of fact-checking in the early 1990s driven by some columns written by David Broder, the columnist for the Washington Post. So there was a, a movement in the 1990s to do more fact-checking of campaign commercials uh, particularly. And, uh, but I think that kind of petered out in, in, uh, by 2000. And, uh, and I think the media was afraid to make the call because they were afraid they might be called biased. And so a lot of fact-checking, to the extent that it was still happening, got kind of watered down and became just another form of, on the one hand, on the other hand, journalism. And, uh, but along came factcheck.org in 2003, started by the Annenberg uh, School at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, Brooks Jackson, former reporter from CNN, and Kathleen Hall Jamison, a uh, longtime expert in political communication and, and campaign commercials uh, who had really done broken new ground in studying the impact of campaign commercials and the way that, uh, and, and the many falsehoods that are included in them. They got things started. Uh, PolitiFact came along in 2007, in large part because of my epiphany in 2004 with the Zell Miller speech. And, uh, uh, and we started fact-checking the presidential campaign in 2007, 2008. We have since grown. We now have PolitiFact sites in 10 states, including here in Wisconsin. So we have fact-checkers who are doing uh, the same sort of fact-checking uh, using our, our distinctive truth meter on Wisconsin politicians. So I think we're at a good moment. I think that uh, I, I think this will indeed be the most fact-checked election, and that's a very good thing. Thank you. Um, so, so Lucas, Bill, uh, Bill points out that this is this, these fact-checking organizations are a really new phenomenon. Really, <coughs> nine years old, the oldest ones, with some of them even um, coming into their second major election cycle. So, maybe you could could you tell us a little bit more about why is why is this the particular decade where these fact-checking organizations emerge? Sure. Um, I mean, I think really there are two origin stories when it comes to fact-checking. 
uh, and they're both important, they're both relevant. One of them is journalistic, and, and Bill just gave you uh, a really good account of that. I mean, in, in that sense, fact-checking is a response to a critique of conventional political reporting that had been developing for decades, you know, and, and I think it's important to understand uh, that it's not only media critics who, uh, who are aware of terms like he said, she said reporting and horse race reporting. Uh, I mean, you know, these, these have had some currency uh, uh, through the 1980s, through the 1990s. So any good journalist worth his or her salt is familiar with these critiques, familiar with these issues. Uh, you have reporters like Bill who, you know, who even as they're going about doing their, their political reporting, their daily work, they have a sense that something is amiss and that journalism is no longer uh, keeping up with the demands of, of the current uh, political environment uh, and that in some sense, you know, that, that the conventions of objective journalism have made journalists uh, easy, easy prey, easy tools for political campaigns who can rely on them uh, consistently to, to give them free media to air their claims without, uh, without ever challenging them, without telling their readers uh, whether those claims are true. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the journalistic origin story. And, you know, that's also inevitably uh, a political origin story. I mean, if, if you looked at this from a, from a political science perspective, you could say that fact-checking is journalism's response uh, to the breakdown of the maybe Cold War political consensus uh, that reigned you know, through, the, through the 50s, the 1960s, into the 1970s, uh, and then began gradually, gradually to fray. Um, but there is another origin story, and I think it's, it's important, and actually I'd, you know, I'm curious what Bill uh, uh, thinks about, about this other origin story, and that is that uh, that there's a technological threat here. Fact-checking is a response to what new media uh, have not only made possible, but have also made necessary. Uh, so uh, in their day-to-day -day work, and I've you know, spent some time at PolitiFact and also at factcheck.org uh, and interviewed just countless of, of these new fact-checking groups and individual fact-checkers, uh, and there's just no question that you couldn't do this in the same way uh, 10 years ago. You know, fact-checking is a creature of the networked uh, news economy. Fact-checkers, you know, rely on the internet and on other news accounts and political texts that they get through the internet at every stage of their work. So they use it uh, in finding claims to check, uh, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a quick manner, uh, in doing the research to, to check those claims, although of course they also do reporting and, and interviews. Uh, and finally, in getting their work out there. I mean, you have, you know, fact-checking groups rely on other media outlets to quote them, to cite them. Uh, they have, uh, you know, websites, of course, which make it easy for bloggers and news outlets to link to them. Uh, I mean, I think Bill has called this a kind of database journalism uh, that wouldn't be possible uh, in, a, in, a, in a paper format. Um, and so, uh, you know, so, so there's a really important technological component here in which fact-checking is responding to what the new media environment affords uh, and to what it makes necessary because it's so easy now for political actors to, uh, you know, to make claims to their, to their narrow audience. And I'll, I'll just close by pointing out, uh, I mean, it's fascinating to think you know, of how much the news environment has changed. Uh, there are many examples of that. Consider transcripts. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that really struck me when I spent uh, a few weeks at, at PolitiFact was the instant availability uh, of, any, uh, of any political statement online as text, right? In some sense, the internet is a, is a massive engine for turning political claims into text, you know, claims that are made in speeches, uh, on the air, in an interview on a 24-hour cable news channel, wherever, you know, soon enough, either the campaign <coughs> or a reporter or a blogger will put that text online, make it available for, for analysis, for dissection, uh, and that's really the kind of environment in which the, the fact checkers thrive. Thanks. Lisa, do you want to jump in there at all? Oh, sure. Well, so um, I'm Lisa Graves, and uh, I'm the new executive director of the Center for Media and Democracy, and it's a joy to be here in my new hometown of Madison and to be invited to this uh, panel uh, to speak, although uh, as, as the panel is being discussed, I had a moment where I thought, why am I here? Um, not because we don't fact check, but because um, the Center for Media Democracy has uh, long been engaged in investigative reporting uh, since it was founded back in 1993 with its first book, Toxic Sludge is Good for You, which was about reporting on the PR industry, 
which had not been a subject to much critical reporting. Um, and uh, we have um, worked uh, to uh, expand that initial seed of work that began here in Madison over the past couple of years as I've been there. But, but I'm uh, the director of an organization that um, launched uh, an alternative to Wikipedia known as SourceWatch. It used to be known as Disinfopedia. Um, and that, uh, that resource was intended to do something um, that, that my organization believed was not being done, which was not just documenting who some of the groups and PR uh, folks were, who some of the emerging groups in some of these ads were, but to connect some of those dots between the groups. Who were the funders? Who were the common personnel? So that we could help tell a story, uh, not just about what someone said, but who they were, who was funding them, um, how they were connected to other organizations. And so SourceWatch uh, is a wiki platform uh, that we use. Uh, we cite to a lot of uh, newspapers and videos and, and primary sources, but it also is designed to um, help tell in some ways a different story than you often get in the corporate media about not just that someone said something, but who that person is, how they're connected to another network of funders or people with a particular agenda. Um, and since I've been at the center, we have worked to do an array of what I would, what could be described as fact checking or could also be described as investigating. Um, and uh, one of the things we've done is launch a site called Bankster USA, which actually documented the real total on the bailout, uh, not just the TARP bailout that was covered over and over and over in the media, but the actual amount of money that was paid up by the Fed, the actual amount of loans that were being sent so that people could have a sense of the true scope of the Wall Street bailout versus just the slice of it that was just repeated endlessly in the news. That, that research was ultimately picked up last year, finally, um, by some other organizations, but for the most part, um, sat out there uh, as an alternative set of information, of indicia of um, how the bailout had proceeded, um, contrary to kind of the, the, the theme or norm that was going on. And in the process of that work, we were extremely critical of the Obama administration as well as the Bush administration in terms of how um, financial matters were being discussed and handled. And so for us, um, I would say we come at the question of fact checking from uh, from a position of deep skepticism about what government officials say and about what PR representatives say. We seldom quote what they say because we think in general, um, I guess our bias would be um, that we think uh, it's a lot of spin. That's why we have a, a site that used to be known as um, the spin, or a, 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 a report that used to be known as the spin, um, because there's a lot of spinning going on. And we know that in the day-to-day -day reporting with um, the deadlines that uh, folks are under, they're reporting what people said. One person said this, another person said that. It's all a bunch of quick quotes. Uh, all of the nonprofit groups and, and political organizations are engaged in attempting to get earned media or free media from the press, get their quote in, uh, and you end up with quote versus quote. And so we, we don't uh, report on things in that way. Uh, we don't have the same pressures uh, as other organizations. We don't have the same deadlines. We don't do... Um, a weekly uh, magazine or a monthly magazine. We report on a daily basis as we um, come across stories that we um, choose to follow, and we work hard to point to uh, point our readers to original material, to the original documents, to original reports, to um, in essence documentary evidence versus quotes. And so, I guess that's what I would just say by way of opening. I don't mean that uh, with any disrespect for um, others um, who are reporting in all sorts of ways and long, the long-standing tradition of, of journalism. But we believe, I guess I would say, our, our bias is that, um, is that we, um, we don't really believe in reporting what people say is happening versus what we think the evidence shows is happening. Cool. So I th from all three of these statements, the clear one of the clear stories is that there's kind of a void in somewhere in American journalism. There's something, there's something missing. To extend kind of the, the ecological um, metaphor, there's a, a niche that isn't being filled somewhere there. There's, there's a, a failure, I guess would be the strong word, that fact checking is coming in to, to fill. So I wonder if we could get into that in a little bit more specificity and maybe since this is a, the ethics conference, can we talk about it in the, in the context of what are the practices and ethics of American journalism that create this kind of vacuum? And how do the, the practices and ethics of fact-checking fill that? Uh, well, I'll, I'll go first. Um, and, and to comment on what Lucas was, was 
posing about sort of um, what's different now. I think what's different now is the filter is gone. Um, in, in the old days, to get a, a political message to the voters, uh, political actors primarily had to go through the news media. And so they had to persuade a reporter or producer that their message was worth repeating. And, and back then, we, had, we were skeptical. And so if we found that something was false or a ridiculous exaggeration, we would not repeat it. And the filter worked in the sense that it kept false messages uh, from getting to, to the public um, to a large extent, I guess I would say. Um, so the filter's gone because now, as Lucas was saying, with, with uh, the internet, with email, with um, cable television, with um, blogs, whatever, there's no more uh, independent news filter that's saying, well, we're not going to repeat that. That's false. So in the old days, you would, you would still get wacky ideas like the president was born in Kenya or the president is a Muslim, and reporters would stop it, and they would just not repeat it. And, um, and it kind of everything changed. I'm a former aviation reporter. I think that the turning point in this was the crash of TWA Flight 800 when Pierre Salinger, who grew up in a paper age, took what was an email with a bunch of conspiracy theories about that flight and repeated them and gave them credibility that they didn't deserve. And the aviation press would have, the aviation press had failed to let those things get out because they were bogus. And I think that was sort of the turning point in this. And um, now, with no filter, uh, political actors and groups can go directly to people much more than they ever could before. And, uh, and so now it is really incumbent on the media to step up and blow the whistle on those things. Um, so the processes, I think, the, the, uh, I think this is an overdue duty on the part of political journalists. And um, they haven't done it because, um, one, they've got a lot of other things to do, and they're trying to cover the campaign, or they're trying to cover the issues, and they haven't seen it as their role to fact check. Also, and, and Lucas has always has interesting thoughts about this, because he's really watched it from 10,000 feet. Fact checking is hard. Uh, fact checking takes time. Fact checking makes people mad. Um, let me tell you, as somebody who's been the target of a lot of criticism, um, uh, you know, this is not for the weak of heart. Uh, this is journalism that you have to have guts to do. And you have to, to be willing uh, to make people mad. I got an email yesterday from a guy saying, um, they, and they always comment on the Pulitzer, you know, but it's been a long time since that Pulitzer. And, uh, <laughs> um, you know, you guys are just so biased. And the problem with this email was I didn't know who he thought we were biased in favor of because we've made everybody mad. And so if you talk to liberals, they'll tell you, uh, they'll cite a few examples of things that they were unhappy with. The conservatives this week are mad at us because we said Mitt Romney was distorting uh, some, some labor figures about women in the workforce and blaming them on Obama. And so this is a great business if you like to make people mad. It's <laughs> but it's, uh, it's not for, for the weak, and so uh, I think you, uh, that's why we don't see a lot of it, and that's a point that Lucas has made before. Um, uh, and finally, to just talk about the process. Um, the, the challenge in creating fact-checking journalism is that we had to invent it. Um, that's, it's not like they teach this stuff in journalism school. There aren't, as far as I know, any classes on fact-checking yet. Um, there are no uh, uh, papers written on what, what is a half true and what is a mostly false. Um, so we had to invent that. And that came with some growing pains, naturally. And uh, so PolitiFact now has been around for five years. And over those five years, we have developed, I think, a very sound, thorough process that involves lots of editing, lots of discussion, lots of thought in making our ratings. Um, and, and case in point, I was talking to a friend of the Washington Post, and I said, hey, when you post, a, when you post something on your blog, um, how many editors have seen that? Uh, how many editors have reviewed that? Zero. 
Um, how many editors look at a PolitiFact story? Three. Uh, and so at a time when the media uh, is, is consolidating and shrinking and editing is, is drying up, PolitiFact's doing more editing than, before, than ever. And, and, and that's the other thing that takes courage, is that it takes a commitment by news organizations to put some serious resources into this journalism. That makes people mad. <laughs> and so you can see why there isn't a ton of it. Still, I'm very encouraged. I think the growth of fact-checking, not just with PolitiFact and our 10 states, but also by others that have been inspired by us around the country is a, is a great sign. Uh, well, actually, just before we move on to, to Lucas, Lisa, I might ask you just, a, for people who don't know about the process of fact-checking, can you just tell us a little bit more about, at PolitiFact, what, do you, what are the kinds of facts that you check? Sure. How does it go through this process? And then I want to highlight, so your comment that it's not like they teach fact-checking in journalism schools. Maybe some of our journalism faculty would like to challenge that, right. but more specifically, what kind of fact-checking? Because there is, you know, what are the facts should be an important part of journalism. What do you mean by that? Maybe sure. Well, I, I'll, I'll take that part first, then I'll tell you about our process. What I mean by um, uh, they're not, it's not being taught in journalism school is there is not a curriculum for political fact-checking. Um, there is definitely instruction about the need to verify facts. And, uh, and you know, when we think of fact-checking, uh, often the New Yorker, Bright Lights, Big City uh, fact-checking gets conflated with what we do. They're two very different things. That's really a form of good editing. Um, what we do is a form of political journalism, a form of accountability journalism. And as far as I know, there is not a curriculum in political fact-checking in, in how to develop these kinds of ratings. Um, if there is, I'd like to know about it because we'd, you know, we'd love to be part of it. I, I heard from one professor at the University of Missouri that um, uh, he had basically taken our work and tried to build a curriculum out of it, but it was, it was sort of, we, we came first and we were inspiring that. Um, so let me just quickly tell you about our process. Uh, so how do we find the facts to check? We have interns who every day comb through the transcripts, watch the campaign ads, and create a list of, of facts that we might check. Our selection criteria is the same one that's been used in American journalism forever, which is let's satisfy people's curiosity. If somebody hears a political message, if they hear Mitt Romney say 92.3% of the job losses under President Obama have been women, if they hear that claim and they wonder, really? Um, then that's something we're <laughs> gonna fact check. And so our goal is the same goal as journalists for decades, let's answer people's curiosity. Um, so, and we wanna pick the most timely uh, claims. We want to be as news as newsy as we can. We want to jump on things quickly while still doing thorough fact checking. The fact checking process itself, once the the assignment is made, um, puts a real emphasis on original documents, original sources. We tell our reporters it's not enough to just quote somebody from an AP story. Find the transcript of the floor debate. Find the original document. Don't just rely on second-hand information, and so we really put an emphasis on, and we, we have examples of things where uh, news organizations have reported things inaccurately, and when we've gone to the transcripts, we've found uh, something very different. Uh, then w uh, a big part of our process is we go to the person who made the claim and say, hey, what's your source on this? And this is often very telling. If they call back quickly, if they respond quickly to an email, um, then, you know, they've, they often have good backup for what they said. If they don't respond, um, then it's a clue that, you know, like we're working on one now involving um, something that uh, Vice President Biden said about guns. And interestingly, we haven't heard back from the White House since we uh, uh, called about, um, you know, hey, where did uh, Vice President Biden get this, uh, this claim? And no reply. Well, that's kind of a clue that maybe they don't have the goods to back up. So. That's another part of the process. We do the reporting, we write the truth meter item. It is line edited in a traditional sense like a regular uh, news story. And then it goes to a three editor panel that makes the determination of the truth meter rating. And of course, in, with PolitiFact, this is what sets us apart 
from factcheck.org and some of the other fact-checking organizations, we make the rating. And the ratings are uh, a, a handy summary, a useful way that if you don't want to read the entire article, you can see the relative accuracy of the statement. It's also something that makes people crazy. Um, <laughs> and, and it is often the truth meter ratings that become the flashpoint for criticism of us. Uh, and what, and, and this has been a surprise to me because I thought um, for the first couple of years, uh, and of course the first, first couple of years we had to spell our name, you know, P-O-L, P -O -L, you know, people had no idea who we were. Um, and, and I thought that people would take those ratings as um, uh, not sort of the final word and, you know, feel free to disagree but still, um, you know, be positive about it. And instead now, um, we have had tremendous debates, as, as many of you may know, about single ratings. Oh my God, can you believe PolitiFact gave that a mostly true, you know, ah, you know, and, and that has really surprised me because I thought that people would look more to the text of the article and focus less on the truth meter rating. And uh, the truth meter ratings have made some people come unglued. And, uh, and that's been really amusing and fascinating, but also a reminder of the, the tremendous care that we need to put into our work. And we take it very seriously. Uh, the final thing I'll say about our process is if we got something wrong, we correct it. We have a process for reviewing things. Uh, this week, uh, the Romney campaign was unhappy with our rating on their claim about the 92.3%. And so they very quickly sent us a letter saying, we want you to review that. Um, and gosh, instantly it showed up in Huffington Post. That must have just been a coincidence. Um, the, uh, uh, so we, were, we very seriously looked at their complaints. We found that they had two good points that, um, uh, of mistakes we had made. We had failed to disclose the two sources that we quoted. Uh, one had worked for the Labor Secretary in the Obama administration, and another had made a campaign contribution to Obama. That was a good point, so we corrected that. We interviewed other economists, uh, reviewed other fact checks of the same claim, and decided that we had made the right call, and so we left the, the ruling at mostly false. Um, so we take this stuff very seriously. We recognize that people won't always agree with our ratings. Um, but. I, I think even if you disagree with a given rating or 10 ratings that we do, I hope you'll, you'll say that the work we do is incredibly valuable in policing this bitter partisan discourse we have and trying to hold these guys accountable for what they're saying. I'd like to pick up a little bit on the, so on the theme that you picked up there of the kind of hostile fact-checking effect is what, is what you have going on. So not only are American journalists and newspapers experiencing hostility from both sides, as, as you said, um, but the, the, same, the same problem has now been adopted by you in the fact-checking business. They attack facts the same way that, they, that we attack other kinds of coverage. So what, what role, or, or how, how is fact-checking dealing with, with the partisan media environment? How is it um, interceding with it, or and is it succeeding in cutting through a little bit? Because the point of fact checking is to give a more factual basis for claims on both sides. Is it able to cut through the the partisanship and the the sense of hostility that so many people feel to the media? Well, um, I don't know, you you want to take that? I, um, sure, or I'll start it off. Um, I mean, the you know first just to underscore something that that Chris said before, I mean, fact-checking is uh, what some sociologists, you know, would call a boundary object in that it's something that a lot of people can talk about without meaning the same thing. Uh, and, you know, I've seen a lot of conversations in which, in which political fact-checkers and journalists have a conversation about fact-checking without ever establishing uh, sort of what they each mean. You know, if we want to take the, the ecological metaphor seriously and think about the different niches that these uh, that these organisms occupy, uh, I think what sets apart the fact checkers uh, is not just the fact that they're they're checking the content of a quote uh, to make sure, uh, you know, not just that it's quoted accurately, but that it is accurate. Uh, but then also they're committing to publicize the results, right? And that's the part that gives traditional journalists pause and really gives 
you know, gives most of us pause, uh, is saying, hey, you know, that's a lie. It's a, it's a naming and shaming. And that's the, the difficult and the awkward part of fact checking. And in some ways, uh, that's what these new media you know, organisms are specialized in. And you can see them as being highly adapted to uh, issuing these verdicts and then taking the heat that results. Uh, and in that, you know, it, it, continuing the ecological metaphor, I mean, uh, you can see fact checking and traditional journalism as being in sort of a symbiotic relationship where, uh, you know, obviously fact checkers rely on traditional news articles a lot in doing their, their day to day work. Uh, and then sometimes traditional news outlets rely on fact checkers uh, in, uh, you know, and they can cite them and say, well, you know, the Romney campaign made this claim or the White House made this claim. Uh, by the way, you know, PolitiFact and factcheck.org said that it's false. Uh, and in that way, they, they get the desired effect of communicating to readers uh, that this, this claim has been questioned without having to take the heat themselves. And you see some, some examples of that. Uh, but there's also, I think, real competition between fact checkers uh, and traditional journalists in that you know, every fact checking piece uh, is in some sense a critique of a traditional report that failed to check that claim. Right? And, you, and you can see some of this tension working out in the conversations about fact checking. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, after the, the Times public editor's uh, 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 column about, about whether, the, whether the, the Times should be a truth vigilante in challenging uh, cl you know, claims that, that, that political actors make. Um, to, to bring it back to, your, to the question about, about how fact checkers deal with, uh, with speaking to, it, you know, to, to a partisan uh, environment and with the heat that they take as a result, uh, I mean, one effect that we've seen, and, and you know, we have some slides about this, but I'm not even sure we need to show them. I mean, it's, it's easily relayable, is that um, you know, fact checking is as, attention to fact checking is as divided as attention to news in general today. So you see very clearly, whether you look uh, at, uh, at bloggers discussing fact checking online, or you look at news outlets citing the work of fact checkers in, in broadcast uh, media, and we've, we've done some content analyses about that. Uh, the partisan fact checkers, like Media Matters on the left, and you know, sometimes FAIR does, does fact checking pieces, uh, or like the MRC on the right, and their, their sort of fact checking site, the uh, uh, Newsbusters, uh, they're cited, you know, they're cited by uh, by like-minded news outlets, right? So while PolitiFact and FactCheck.org are cited primarily on CNN, uh, 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 Newsbusters and Media Matters are cited primarily by the partisan news outlets, Fox and MSNBC. Interestingly, uh, they're not only cited by partisans on their side, they're also cited by partisans on the other side. So the single biggest source of broadcast citations for Media Matters is actually Fox News. Uh, which loves to take things that, that David Brock has said or, or Media Matters has said and say that's ridiculous, right? So they're engaging in this back and forth, uh, whereas the, the nonpartisan fact checkers have been more effective in, in, addressing a wider, uh, in, in addressing a wider audience, although I think it's a constant struggle to not be seen as, uh, as being partisan in their work. And you know, the, one of the ethical questions that fact-checking raises, for instance, is uh, do you have the responsibility in this new kind of journalism to, uh, to draw larger conclusions from what, from what your work reveals, right? So are you just checking individual claims? Or if, if you find a pattern over time, is it your responsibility to say, hey, we've learned something about, you know, the, about, the American, uh, about American politics, about the American news environment, and we're going to, to tell you that, you know, what are the differences in the ways that, that the parties lie, for instance, uh, even at the risk of then being seen as a partisan news outlet and losing that, that currency. Can I answer that I, question? Or, oh, oh, go ahead. I, I would love to jump in here because I have to say that I'm sort of appalled at the notion that media research, that MRC, that Bozell's group, is, is doing much other than uh, a, a lot of smears. Um, in fact, they smeared us. 
Uh, they suggested that because we had a site called Bankster USA, we were somehow responsible for the bombing in, of the Deutsche Bank uh, uh, executive in Germany, um, which was pretty absurd. They've also claimed the Muppets are uh, terribly anti-business. Um, I, I think that I think that categorizing them in with other groups that actually do a lot of serious documentation, and I would put Media Matters in the category of groups that do a lot of serious documentation, though it's disputed by Fox News, I think is, it, does a, it does a bit of a disservice, in my, from my point of view, to uh, the really intensive fact-checking work that's done by, by, by organizations like Media Matters, which... Um, Sorry, I, could I, could I yeah, hop sure, in really quick sure. and ask you, just to give us a little more context, who are these organizations, who are they funded by, how can we kind of place them in the media sphere? Well, sure. I mean, uh, Bozell's group is funded by the right. They don't have very much disclosure of who their funders are. Uh, there are a lot of tentacles that have been documented. I think we have some of that on our site. Media Matters is uh, constantly called out in uh, Fox News and other places for being funded by, uh, in part by George Soros and by the Open Society Institute. Um, I sh would disclose to you that CMD has had a one-time grant from OSI for my work researching the Department of Homeland Security uh, and the spending of DHS um, that is part of my expertise before I came to CMD when I was working as the uh, deputy, deputy Chief of the Center for National Security Studies and testified before Congress on matters involving the Department of Homeland Security satellite surveillance and uh, foreign intelligence wiretapping and electronic surveillance of Americans. Um, and of course, we've been then criticized for daring to have uh, accepted a single grant in an area of my particular expertise and have been criticized by uh, Fox and, <coughs> and company for uh, being supposedly a Soros puppet, which I think is absurd and ridiculous. Uh, our funders don't dictate or direct our um, results or the, the work that we do. We aren't funded by corporations. We aren't funded by uh, government grants uh, from government agencies. Um, we're funded primarily by individuals, and most of our donations are from very small uh, amounts, like five or twenty five dollars or twenty dollars, um, of people saying they want to have an organization that's actually documenting, uh, with resource to real evidence, what's happening in some of these uh, situations. And for the Center um, for Media and Democracy and PR Watch and uh, our work on Alec Exposed, we have worked to make it possible for individuals, individual citizens and journalists to have access to, in essence, raw material, to original material, to make it widely available, um, and to help people tell stories that aren't being told, that were not being told about some of these groups or some of these entities, and we take pride in that. And so while I, I think it is true that the emergence of um, new fact-finding organisms is a, is, a, is a sort of new thing and a good thing, I actually think that a lot of our work is in the finest traditions of old school journalism, which is deep skepticism about what people say versus the reporting you see time and time again on TV and in, the, um, in newspapers, which is quote versus quote. Uh, can I just say I'd like to fact check that claim about the Muppets being anti-business. <laughs> um, my sense that might be a half true because you've got, you know, you've got Fozzie Bear, who I think of as sort of pro-business, but then not really sure about Miss Piggy. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh, good. You were going to respond to Lucas, Bill? Um, you, you had raised a question about um, should we go beyond the fact check and begin to draw conclusions? And that's that's a difficult turf, um, and I think I, I liken us to an umpire. If you ask an umpire who's, who's out at home more often, the Brewers or the Cardinals, the umpire is going to say, well, I look at every call separately. I don't know. Um, and you don't go to the umpire for analysis of the game. And I think, um, likewise, uh, although that's not a perfect analogy, and clearly we do some analysis at PolitiFact, particularly with our Obamater feature where we trace the campaign promises of Barack Obama and our state sites have similar features like the Waco meter that follows the promises of Governor Walker. Um, and we do do analysis there. You know, how's, how's he doing on his health care promises? How's he doing on his tax promises? Um, but I, I think you get when uh, the more you get into that analysis area you do as you said lucas you know you're getting into some interpretation that i think um can make it harder to come back and say wait i'm the umpire um so i'm gonna still keep calling the balls and strikes 
But yes, I said the Cardinals pitching is weak, you know. So, um, so we don't venture into that too much. You, you'll see what we do is this. We'll give you the data, and a lot of, of what's great about PolitiFact is we're so transparent and, uh, and our work is all out there, which allows you to assess it and determine whether you agree with it. And likewise, you can look at records. So you can see what's Mitt Romney's record on the truth meter what's uh, Barack Obama's record. And um, we don't, and, and to the extent that we do analysis of that, we'll pretty much just kind of repeat what the numbers show. So you take Michelle Bachman, who was known in, during the Republican presidential campaign as having a problem with getting facts right. And part of the reason that she was known for that was we had done a lot of fact checking of her and she had gotten a lot of falses and pants on fires. Um, so we'll repeat that and we'll say, you know, here's the PolitiFact report card on Michelle Bachman and yeah, it's interesting to know that the first 13 times we fact checked her, she never got anything higher than a false. Um, <laughs> but we don't go any farther than that and we don't try to analyze, you know, why is that and what's she doing and whatever. And, we want to leave that to others so that we can retain our role as the umpire. Well, I just want to say what I mean. What's fascinating about that is that uh, you know it echoes perfectly, although sort of at one more level of remove, uh, the reason why a traditional political reporter uh, would not engage in assessing individual claims, which is the argument that. Well, uh, as soon as you start evaluating, characterizing, drawing conclusions about something. Uh, a political figure said, then inevitably at some point uh, you're going to be uh, sort of drawing on some larger framework, right? Some political viewpoint about what should be the case, uh, you know, what the country should look like. Uh, you know, you, it's hard to draw a fine line between factual analysis uh, and larger subjective normative ideas about, uh, you know, about the way that things should be. Uh, and this is something that, that fact checkers wrestle with, I think, you know, in a really honest way uh, all of the time. Uh, a great example that, that I think comes up over and over uh, in, in fact checking work is analyzing, uh, analyzing unemployment statistics where uh, the particular baseline that you use reflects something about, you know, about, uh, about how you think, what the employment picture should look like. So if you use the traditional uh, measure of unemployment that leaves out people who've completely given up looking for work, uh, then, you know, somebody could criticize you and say that arguably you're, you're supporting this deceptive practice of, of under-reporting under unemployment. If instead you include people who've given up and you include people who, you know, are only working part-time, people who are underemployed, then, uh, you know, you're taking a little bit of a position. You're starting to take a stance about uh, which is the most honest number, which is the right number. Uh, it's fascinating that in that, in the exchange, which the Times reported on yesterday, it was in, the Times had an article yesterday about an exchange between PolitiFact and the Romney campaign. Uh, and I couldn't tell if, if, was that actually a fact check or was that an article about the scuffle between you guys? It's really... I, exactly. In fact, you look at that and, I, and it's an example that you cited before, which is that um, some in the media, even when they're doing fact checking, because this article was billed in the Times as a, what do they call their fact checks? Um, a checkpoint? Or checkpoint. A so it had the label checkpoint on it, and it was written by Catherine Rampell, um, if I'm saying her name right, very good economics writer. Um, but she did not say what the Romney, uh, she didn't say, the, didn't make value judgments like the Romney campaign statement is very misleading or uh, or highly dubious, as AP did. Um, what she did was quote us and, and quote us calling the statement mostly false. She then gave the Romney campaign one paragraph to say PolitiFact's using spin and, you know, they, I think uh, the Romney campaign had said it was Obama for America spin um, was how they characterized our work. Um, but that was a great example of what Lucas has seen, which is that many news reporters prefer to, to cite an independent fact checker as opposed to making that determination themselves. And, and I don't, and you know, Lucas has seen like in the New Yorker, we've been quoted many times in the New Yorker, uh, you know, fact check, or PolitiFact and factcheck.org found those statements false. Um, and that's, that's fine. I think 
having a separation between the beat reporter and the fact checker is fine, as long as the news organizations are doing the verification, are doing this kind of accountability journalism. Um, I do think there are benefits to it, because if you're a beat reporter and you're covering the governor and you're counting on getting some cooperation from the governor, the minute you give him a pants on fire, you're going to have a hard time getting your calls returned. And so what we have found with our states, in some of our states where beat reporters are doing the fact checking, that uh, that makes it harder for them to, to cover their beats. And so I, I, I like that. And I thought that was, that was fine on the part of the, the Times yesterday because readers who got that, I think, got a good sense that the Romney statement was hugely misleading. Although it was also, it's interesting that it was technically accurate, right? Yes. But it was, but the context made it misleading, and that's another one of the dilemmas that, that fact checkers encounter. I, I was just going to say, you know, I, I was so excited when uh, PolitiFact emerged, and um, and we do look at it uh, obviously um, from time to time, and with particular attention to the footnotes cited by the reporters there. Um, but I wonder a couple things, if you if, if you wouldn't mind my asking, um, you know, one is um, one is I've always wondered about the context, like the weight of the lie, the gravity of the lie, because. Uh, when I look at Dick Cheney's page, you know, versus Joe Biden's page, and I think, you know, there are some disputes over a particular economic figure. Is this accurate or inaccurate? How much of a lie is it? And then there are disputes over matters that might be greater uh, about war and peace or, you know, going, committing troops to war. And I think it must be difficult as you, as you, as you all work through the various facts to not have a way to describe how, not just that the, the fact that this is a lie, but sort of, the, sort of the magnitude of that lie, because I, I, I think when you look at a particular politician, every politician, and because they all lie, they all have a bunch of uh, lies, right? And it's, I think it's hard, to, it's hard sometimes to, for uh, readers, perhaps, to get a sense of the magnitude of that lie. And I, so I wonder, like, do you get that critique, or have you thought about the, the magnitude question versus the sort of, I'm sure you get criticized all the time for this is the picky lie, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, you guys are nitpickers. Um, we get. And, um, you know, part of it is we, we can't fact check opinions. We also have real difficulty fact checking claims about national security and terrorism because those things are just not on the record enough. We started to do one on a Biden claim about the number of Al Qaeda operatives in Afghanistan versus Iraq. And it, it just, you're basically relying on the administration's numbers, um, and, and so we decided we couldn't do it. So there's some things like, could we have fact-checked yellow cake uranium um, back if, we had, if, if we'd been around right. in 2003? Right. That'd be tough. Um, now, there was some great reporting done by Knight Ritter on that, um, but, and, and the thing to remember, PolitiFact is one uh, genre, is one niche, um, and there are plenty of other ways. The work, the kind of work that you guys do, the work that uh, any kinds of investigative reporters do that fill in all these gaps. We are doing a, a distinctive kind of fact checking, and it's not going to, it's not one size that fits all. Right. Um, we do get criticized that we nitpick. Um, m my feeling about facts is that um, facts are building blocks. Uh, they're like bricks in a house, that they are building blocks for a political argument. And so, Sometimes that political argument is very, um, has huge implications, like a decision to go to war or not to go to war. Uh, other times it might be, it, is uh, healthcare in America an, in enough trouble that we need health, you know, a healthcare law uh, that requires people to have health insurance, et cetera. So the fact, do, are there 47 million people without health insurance? That's an important fact to check. Now, you might look at that and say, well, who cares whether it's 47 million or 40 million or whatever? But I, th I think it's important for us to hold them accountable for that. Um, but we're not, w w the truth meter doesn't work in all circumstances. Um, we do, and I think, in, and that's also why we created the Obometer, our feature that tracks campaign promises. It gets uh, sort of less, it, it is less controversial and therefore, uh, you know, our, our rulings, our ratings on the promises don't get the kind of criticism and attention that fact checking does. But I think it's, it's really important because you can look at the Obometer and you can get a good sense of what's Obama done? What has he not done? Um, what did he say he would do? And likewise, here in Wisconsin, you look at some of the claims that Walker made, the, the promise uh, about adding 350,000 jobs is his centerpiece promise. 
And PolitiFact Wisconsin has done some tremendous reporting into that. And so there are different ways we can do this. At PolitiFact, we, we sort of practice journalism through meters. Um, and because uh, I think meters are useful as a rating device. And they're also handy because we know readers aren't going to read a long story. Um, and one of the flaws, I think, in accountability journalism has been the assumption and almost arrogance by reporters that, um, well, People should read that long 40-inch story about whatever. Um, well, we know. We don't even read those stories ourselves. So one of the things as we created PolitiFact was that we would layer it, that we would have it so that you could look at a glance and see what's the relative accuracy of that statement, and then read the full story to get more, and then click through to our sources. And I just want to say, I, I'm not suggesting that, you're, that, the rater, that the rating is all picky. I just, it, just, it just struck me that you probably get that criticism sure, from absolutely. candidates all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to ask one more question on this, on this polarization and, and debate line. Um, and then I, I do want to invite questions, both from our, our offline audience here and our social media audience um, in, in the wider cyber world. Um, but um, so w one of the common analys analysis of, uh, of American journalism is that this, this so-called um, view from nowhere or an unwillingness to challenge the facts um, within news stories has emerged from attacks, attacks from the two sides, which has drawn some, some minority of media sources into polarized media outlets, while the, the centrist kind of mainstream press has adopted this view from nowhere, as Jay Rosen has called it. Um, is there a danger that the fact checkers will suffer the same fate? that they will, like you, you mentioned, being, a, being attacked from both sides. Is there a danger that you, you either will be drawn to one of the polls and become labeled as the liberal politifact or the conservative politifact, or go to such an extent to, to equalize your fact checking that you, you adopt the same type of fact checking view from nowhere that the American press maybe has suffered? Is there, is there a way out of that? Um, I don't know. What do you What do you think about that? I think that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, we uh, somebody asked me last night. Uh, do you keep tally of your truthometer ratings? And the answer is no. I don't keep track of. We we don't keep tabs on you know how many Democrats we've done, how many Republicans we've done, what percentage Republicans get false, whatever. Because that's something that's just not important to me. What, what I need to know is what are the most significant political claims um, on any given day, and we'll fact check them. And the ratings go where they go. And I don't want to know the data, because I don't want to feel any pressure at all to say, man, we just gave the Republicans a false. Let's give the Democrats a false. Um, now, the only, uh, the only time you'll see me even come close to that is when I'll look at the home page and I'll say, man, we've got 18 of 20 fact checks on one party. Let's get some Democrats today or let's get some Republicans today, meaning let's get some items on them. Um, and uh, just in the sense that we, we don't want to always check Republicans, we don't want to always check Democrats. But that's the only extent that we'll go to for that. And to be clear, you're not saying these are all false. You're saying these are all claims that you've checked. Exactly. And, okay. you know, now others, and of course the, what separates us from the others is you can easily, and in fact, there are, there are entire websites dedicated to following us, and they, you know, one of them, uh, Politipsychotics, has a database <laughs> of, of every item we've done, and Karen Street, who runs it, um, it does statistical analysis of our work. And so that can be done, and people do it, and they reach different conclusions. Uh, there was a researcher at the University of Minnesota tallied up our work in 2010 and said, um, one, that we did roughly the same number of Republicans and Democrats, which I thought was interesting, um, and that uh, we had given Republicans uh, two falses for every false that Democrats got. Three. Three? Three. OK. So, um, <laughs> um, so, you know, and my feeling was, huh, interesting. Um, and, and that's not data that I follow on a given day. And of course, what happened when that hit the blogosphere? Predictable response. The Republicans said, oh, this is evidence of PolitiFact's liberal bias. 
and that um, uh, there is selection bias in the way that we choose things because we're out to get the, the conservatives. And the liberals said, no, this is proof that conservatives lie more. So, um, and that's going to happen. And I think w one of the things I've, I've developed in five years of doing this is thick skin to realize, you know, we're going to make people mad probably every day. And that's part of what we do. Um, and particularly now that we are at, that we are so well known, um, we're going to have more episodes like we had this week where the Romney campaign made a big deal about our rating and actually got, you know, some, a lot of ink out of it by, you know, they leaked the letter to Huffington Post and Huffington Post made it sound like um, uh, there was, a, you know, something really flawed in our fact checking. And we, uh, I, I think we're going to be seeing more of that because we're very much under the microscope. And that's fine. I mean, I think, I, I don't expect people to agree with everything we do. And, um, and I don't even agree with every rating we make. You know, we have a process where two editors, it takes two of three editors to make a rating, and sometimes I'm the, I'm the outlier. I'm the guy saying, it should be mostly false, and everybody else says mostly true, or whatever. So this is a, this is a difficult judgment process. Um, but I, so, you know, what I, I worry more about just the hardened partisanship of our country than I worry that, um, fact checkers are going to get caught up in that. I think people will always respect us. I think they'll disagree with us some. They'll agree with us some. I think it'll be sort of a conditional love, like it has been. Um, they'll love us when it suits their purposes, and they'll dislike us when it doesn't. Oh, sure, I'll just add that uh, you know, I think that really is the key sort of tension in fact checking work, is that on the one hand, there's a commitment to call things like you see them, uh, to you know, to, to 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 not be afraid to say that a politician is misleading his or her public, uh, if indeed that's the case. Uh, but at the same time, to uh, in order to reach a wide audience and in order to be relevant in, in political discussion in the American political system, uh, to try not to get drawn into sort of one one camp or the other, sort of no matter what you know the data say over a period of years. Uh, and you know, I think uh, Lisa is entirely right that uh, that uh, you know you can find the roots of fact-checking work, uh, meaning journalism that's unafraid to challenge political claims. Uh, you know, decades ago, even a century ago, in muckraking journalism, uh, but it's noteworthy that muckrakers, you know, were not objective by today's standards. Right? They took up causes. Uh, they they you know they uh, they identified with particular political parties or against the system in its entirety. Uh, but they, were, they did not hide their politics. They embraced uh, political viewpoints. And there's an argument that, uh, that fact-checking journalism as a kind of journalism that, uh, you know, that evaluates and characterizes and assesses lives more comfortably in that kind of news, in that kind of media, in that kind of passionate, muckraking, uh, that's not objective by today's standards. And that really the, you know, the interesting thing uh, and the compelling thing about what factcheck.org and PlitiFact uh, are trying to do is that they're bringing this behavior that has this long history in, uh, in partisan journalism, in muckraking journalism, into uh, something that looks more like objective journalism. And there's a lot of, a lot of tension and a lot of difficulty that goes, uh, that goes along with that. Are there questions? Yes, sir. No, I'll yes. Okay. Uh, just to note, uh, we're recording this and we're also live streaming it, so we're going to insist that you talk into the microphone. Thank you. Uh, this is a question that actually stems from a, a PolitiFact column uh, that ran in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel uh, last Saturday. And in the intro to the column, it mentions that PolitiFact has given Romney uh, a number of, previously, a number of false ratings. So the question is this, has a candidate ever said, on second thought, you, if, if you rated him false, or her false, on second thought, you know, you were right, uh, I, I retract that statement. And if that has not happened, 
does that mean that essentially the big lie or the medium-sized lie is alive and well? That is, they'll just keep repeating the same thing, and so the spirit of Joseph Goebbels is, <laughs> is, is still with us. Um, well, both things have happened. Um, uh, there have been many cases where, particularly the staffs of elected officials, have acknowledged that the you know that someone got something wrong. As minor as uh, President Obama screwed up a number about Illinois when he meant Indiana, or vice versa. Um, uh, in uh, sometimes in a, a stock line in a speech will just get corrected. Obama was using a stock line in 2008 that gas prices were the highest they'd ever been. We we said that was false. When you control for inflation, they'd actually been higher in 1981. He corrected that, and in the speech the next night, and subsequently, he said it accurately. Um, so there have been many cases like that. Even in the case of some talk show hosts that we fact-checked, uh, old Keith Olbermann and Bill O'Reilly, on both ends of the spectrum, when we have found their statements false, have acknowledged the falsehoods and apologized. Um, John Stewart, uh, when we gave him a false uh, said, uh, you know, I accept their judgment and I apologize for getting it wrong. He was talking about Fox News. So um, there have been many instances where when we call someone on a falsehood, they will, they will acknowledge it and in some cases apologize. But of course, what also happens is when there is a good talking point, they'll keep repeating it even when it's false. Case in point, uh, the government takeover of health care. Uh, which was a statement that Republicans repeated over and over and over and are still repeating in describing the Democratic health care law. That is false. That is pants on fire wrong. The Democratic law is not a government takeover of health care by any reasonable definition of government takeover. And we uh, rated that false so often that in 2010 we named that our lie of the year. Um, and. Uh, you know, members of Congress went on the floor of the House and said, the liberal media would have you believe this is false. It's not. It is a government takeover of health care. So they're still repeating it, even to the point Michelle Bachman used that phrase to describe the Massachusetts health care plan, said Mitt Romney's plan was a government takeover of health care. You go back, that was a phrase that uh, Frank Luntz had urged Republicans to use and that uh, because it, it touched the right buttons for people. So there are also plenty of examples of that. And, uh, and I think that just emphasizes the need for us to be doing this stuff. Because these guys, when they get a good talking point, they'll just keep repeating it. Um, and you know, regardless of whether it is accurate or not. I have a question our... from someone who's unnamed. How do we feel about anonymity? Uh, but <laughs> the Center for Media and Democracy person called PR spin. But doesn't PR often have to correct poor reporting in the media? Don't journalists get it wrong a lot of the time themselves? Well, I, I, I guess if I, if I, my bias would be that um, reporters get it right a lot more than PR flax, um, quite frankly. But, um, you know, PR industry is, has grown so exponentially over the last several decades. I think that there was a study um, uh, cited by Bob McChesney and, and John Nichols about how there are more people in PR than in journalism nowadays. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's so much influence of the PR industry that um, I think another study was done about the uh, great, one of the great old papers, the Baltimore Sun, and how much of the reporting was uh, from original sources from government uh, from going to the government and actually following those beats versus repeating press releases use, b based on press releases. And the use and reliance on press releases has just grown exponen exponentially. And uh, PR professionals are trained. Uh, some of them are trained sort of within schools that sort of overlap a bit between feeding students into journalism and feeding students into PR, um, that, that those individuals are trained to tell the truth in a particular way or, or to, to, to ignore certain big truths and refocus attention elsewhere. And so um, there's certainly spin uh, on all sides and in all sorts of ways, but, um, but the PR professionals are paid specifically to help their corporation or their interests look better, and journalists are not paid uh, to do that. 
um, and even journalists who um, are not in this sort of neutral or what you would describe as independent, me independent um, unbiased, you know, I think there's a lot of journalists who are part of the independent media who have been criticized as being biased because they do have a perspective. Maybe their uh, perspective is, um, you know, one of uh, uh, trying to tell the story of working people uh, from the standpoint of work workers versus corporations and corporate PR. Um, I don't think that that makes the, that reporting illegitimate at all. I think it's a very valuable, important part of the discourse. In fact, uh, the reporting on on working people's perspectives on on unions and other perspectives is one that you don't see very often in the media. In fact, um, there was a time when on MSNBC you never even saw a union leader speaking. You could go through MSNBC for a year or two until I think Ed Schultz had someone on last year where you never even saw a union leader quoted, but you could see corporate PR people quoted on a regular basis. And so the suggestion of, I think, I think the, the question suggests an utterly false equivalency between uh, what people who are PR reps are saying and what reporters and journalists and investigators uncover. The fact checker in me wants to fact check that MSNBC claim you just made. Please do. <laughs> no, really, that would be great because I, uh, I, have a, I, I believe it to be the case that there were, I, I would love to find out when MSNBC had its first uh, union rep. My, my understanding from a very good source was that there was, in essence, uh, a rule against uh, against really having the union reps on, and that there was a notion that there was not an audience. The audience wasn't interested in hearing from that point of view. And that would be, and while all sorts of other points of view were, were very well represented, but please, that would be awesome. Please well, fact check that. We just have to decide, do we do the Muppets one first? <laughs> Muppets, <laughs> then union, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, first of all, everything that you guys do is, is I know, tremendously hard work and you perform a great service. But I also think it's incredibly sad and true that it takes a special kind of journalist nowadays to make people mad, be willing to call out their sources. And I'm wondering to what extent you're becoming a crutch for media that should be doing their own job. A beat reporter doesn't wants the access, so they're going to let, fa let PolitiFact or Fact Check do the fact checking and not do their job. Why don't you take that one? Sure. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's, you definitely see some uh, instances of that. So you've seen fact checkers cited more and more frequently by traditional news outlets. Uh, there was this New Yorker story a few weeks ago uh, that cited PolitiFact and factcheck.org like 10 times almost. And it was really, must have been some, some kind of record. <laughs> um, you know, whether that's a good or a bad thing is open for debate. On the one hand, that gets more fact-checking journalism, gets more challenging of public claims uh, out there, you know, in, in front of the reader, uh, and arguably it begins to sort of acclimate uh, that news organization to, you know, to this kind of journalism, right? And, and you've, I think in many news outlets, you've seen a parallel increase both in their citation of fact-checkers and in their in-house fact-checking. Uh, so, you know, the New York Times is a great example. They've clearly been stepping up uh, their fact-checking efforts uh, over the last uh, over the last five years, um, you know, the, the the critique is often is often made is often leveled that uh, really this shouldn't be a special kind of journalism, right? Every single uh, uh, report from the campaign trail should be a fact-checking piece. Why have you know one article about what was said at the debate? and then a separate sidebar about whether it was true or not, right? That seems a little yeah. absurd. Uh, you know, and it, it, it does seem absurd uh, on, on its face to, to me as well, but I think there are interesting questions about uh, why that's the case and whether there are any good reasons for that to be the case. I mean, what kind of pressures or tensions uh, would reporters run into if they started doing that in every single story that they filed, if they started very quickly, you know, uh, uh, inserting fact checks uh, throughout their work and and uh, critiquing public figures. I mean, you know, that's exactly the kind of journalism I'd love to see. But I'm also curious about how that would change the job of reporting. Whether other kinds of stories would be uh, would be more difficult to pursue. And I think that's a completely open question. But, yeah. but I, and, and, I, and I think when you when you look at the time scale that's happening with the reporting on the debates and such, what you see is people reporting what was said 
because it actually takes time to, re to refute or rebut or examine whether what they said was true. And um, I'm not trying to justify it at all. I mean, I'm just suggesting that when you, when you just see the expectation, I suppose, uh, that comes through the, both the print and uh, television reporting, it then it, but, but I, I think there, that's part of it, is this time pressure that I suppose people feel that it takes, it takes it's hardly any time to quote them. It takes a huge amount of time. Uh, Brendan Fisher is here from my office. Um, and others uh, and my team who spend enormous amounts of hours actually trying to find uh, you know, whether something is true or, or false. Um, that takes a lot of time and it's not as, as uh, amenable, I suppose, to this expectation. But the other part is, the other part that's what, what you see in journalism uh, in the mainstream or corporate media that you know, we have, I would describe as utter disdain for in, in our shop is is that horse race mentality. They all sit there and comment afterwards um, about you know, what people said and whether they said it well and what they looked like and whether they were confident in the lie they told. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and I think that that is, uh, it, to me, that's discreditable. And it's, um, it, uh, it creates a, a, an atmosphere about uh, what matters and what doesn't matter that I think um, you know, is most unfortunate. I, I think that's a great point about uh, good accountability journalism taking time and there is this hope that um, we could fact check debates like the pop-up videos on VH1 you know where the little bubble comes up and would say you know that's not true um, <laughs> I was on Morning Joe once and Mike Barnacle suggested for a debate that um, when somebody said something false that I would walk out on stage and slap them across the face <laughs> um, Un unfortunately, <laughs> we're not quite that quick. Um, it, takes a, it takes about a day to do a typical fact check. You know, some take two days. And these time pressures, and you see Brooks, uh, Brooks and I have talked about this, and we sort of started the arms race and then backed off, um, of trying to fact check debates instantly. Um, we, um, when we started, Brooks gave me some advice and said, um, uh, live fact checking is the road to hell. <laughs> And, and of course, my thought as a competitive creature was, well, we're going to do it anyway, you know, because you guys don't do it. And so we started doing it. And then Fact Check started doing it. And, um, and then we discovered that we were making some, um, some uh, rushed decisions late at night and decided, you know, we're not going to do that um, except for the biggest event. So we'll do live fact checking for the fall debates, but we haven't done them for this uh, long stream of 20 Republican debates. And, uh, but in the meantime, factcheck.org is doing it, you know, and so is uh, the Washington Post fact checker. So, but it's, it's hard. It takes time to get this stuff right. And you don't want to make mistakes. We've, we did one in January. We took a lot of heat for from liberals who uh, felt we made the wrong call in a fact check in the Obama State of the Union address. And we ended up changing that rating because we, we agreed that we had made the wrong call. So you don't want to do this stuff too fast. I'm curious uh, if you've seen um, newspapers uh, doing their own fact checking uh, in a successful model that, that, that works for them, uh, uh, perhaps where um, it's not the beat reporter who does it, but it's a different reporter, or they put it under a brand name uh, to keep it separate, or something like that, that you've seen work models that work. Um, I've seen it work both ways. I mean, in the case of PolitiFact, um, uh, our, uh, some, some of our partners, um, the Memphis paper, the Knoxville paper, Cleveland, uh, put beat reporters, have their beat reporters do PolitiFact items. Um, and some of our best items are done by the Washington Bureau Chief of the Cleveland Plain Dealer, Steve Koff, who uh, does great political reporting and also does great PolitiFact items. And, um, just you know, is is just one of the best journalists I know. Um, at at other papers, we have seen a um, a mix. Uh, many started fact checking blogs uh, inspired by us and Fact Check, and I think if you look at those, I think they are written largely by political reporters who are doing other kinds of things. They're not dedicated to fact checking. Uh, even Voice of San Diego, a local news site, started a fact-checking uh, page similar to ours and in, uh, inspired by ours. Um, and I think the re reporters doing that out of necessity are also doing other things. 
Um, but that can still be good reporting. You just have to guard against that idea that you're going to pull a punch because you've got to call the governor's chief of staff later. And, um, but that's really no different. That pressure has been there forever that um, you, in covering anyone on a beat, if you write negative stories, you run the risk you're going to make them mad. And you have to always put the reader's interest first. Uh, I think probably still the best model is separate fact checkers because we are immune from that pressure. The great thing, and I, I realized this in 2008, um, uh, people would say, well, you know, do you want to interview Obama? You know, do you want to interview David Pluff? And no, I don't care. Um, I, you know, I, I have no need for access. And of course, that's what they control. They control access and the inside information and whatever. And so that's what they always hold over you as a beat reporter. When you're an independent fact checker, you don't care. I, I don't care if I ever get an interview with Barack Obama. That's not something PolitiFact would do. Um, so they really don't have anything on us. And that gives us the independence to make a call. But I, and I, and I, I, think, I, I think in that point, that, that when, when um, Stephen Colbert gave that you know, incredible speech at the White House Press Correspondents' Center, it was... It was so revealing because, in part, I think that access is a corrupting. It, it, it does corrupt the way things are covered. It certainly uh, has, has a corrupting impact on uh, the way the White House is covered, whether it's a Democrat in the White House or a Republican in the White House, in terms of access to these unnamed sources, these secret sources. It's most, uh, it's most difficult in the national security arena, which I've worked on in other ways for a long time. But um, I, I think that, that, I think that the culture of access, the chummy relationship in some ways that develops between uh, some of the government sources and um, reporters, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's I think a huge problem in the way stories are covered and the, uh, the way the news, and it's not just the Judith Miller uh, problem. There's a lot more than that problem. That's just one aspect of it. And, um, you know, I certainly would like to see more corporate Corporate media have have a have have more involved in fact checking by those reporters, but I understand the the difficulty. But I, the alternative is that the fame the famous named reporter, the White House correspondent with all the access, has all the attention. Their stories are covered, and the fact checking piece is like you know a, an errata or a, a correction like the next day. And I think that's a huge problem from the standpoint of how people what people learn about what's happening in our government. I'm going to turn to our social media. So we have another one. What's the difference between fact-checking and media criticism, whether popular, John Stewart, or more academic? How, do, how does media criticism inter interact with fact-checking in a media ecology like we have today? I, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. Uh, the, you know, one of the interesting things you notice when you look at the, at the sort of media ecology is that uh, the partisan fact-checkers uh, and especially Media Matters, which I agree, by the way, you know, does the most substantial fact-checking work of, of sort of the various groups that, that do this sometimes. Uh, the partisan fact-checkers frame their fact-checks as media criticism uh, in a way that PolitiFact and FactCheck.org and the Washington Post do not. Uh, but they'll often be rating the very same claim, uh, and the analysis will be indistinguishable. But, you know, instead of saying uh, this politician got it wrong, uh, uh, Media Matters will say Fox News got it wrong. You know, they exist primarily to, to expose uh, misinformation, which is circulated uh, on Fox News, or at least you'd get that impression if you, you know, if you visit their site often enough. But the substance of the the analysis is the same, uh, and I think it, um, you know, it raises an interesting question about why, uh, about why traditional fact checkers about what, why objective fact checkers don't do that as much. Uh, and I think, I mean, I've heard Bill say, and, you know, it makes sense. I mean, uh, they're not in the business of critiquing their peers in the press. Uh, you know, the point is to hold political figures accountable. But one of the very interesting things about this kind of journalism uh, is that every fact check is implicitly a little bit a critique of the press, right? Because so many of these claims uh, appeared first in a traditional news outlet, went unchallenged, uh, and that's where an intern at PolitiFact or FactCheck.org finds them and says, hey, we should challenge this, uh, you know, this thing that, that, uh, that the Romney campaign said, which is in the New York Times or is, is in this AP article, uh, et cetera. So there's always this implicit critique and the suggestion that journalism at large uh, should be doing more of this. Uh, 
but in the, you know, the objective fact checkers never make that critique or almost never make that critique sort of very directly, very openly, whereas the, the more politically oriented fact checkers uh, seem to be doing mainly uh, media criticism. And I, for, from my perspective, having r read through enor an enormous amount of the different pieces of this, I, I think personally that Media Matters plays a really important role in fact checking an enormously powerful news organization in Fox that has been documented over and over and over again to spread disinformation and whose readers in independent polling uh, tend to believe things that simply aren't true. Um, and yet Fox has spent an enormous amount of time attacking Media Matters because Media Matters uh, outs, Fox, uh, outs things state, stated by Fox commentators that are simply false. And so now what's happened when uh, I'm out in the, in the world uh, talking with folks is that when you run into someone who is a Fox News believer, they, they won't even listen to uh, something that Media Matters has documented as false. They've been so, in essence, indoctrinated that, that you can't trust that source. And I, and I think that there, I think there is um, this issue of, of bias, who's bias, what's independent, what's not independent, uh, you know, uh, partisan or not partisan. I know there's this critique of Media Matters, although they are a non, they are, uh, you know, a nonpartisan 501c3 organization. Um, they've been criticized for the uh, campaign uh, activities, I, I, I understand, of Brock. But the fact is, is that um, their materials are very well documented in many, many, many respects. And, um, and yet a, another part of what's been happening and that hasn't been largely covered, I think, in the media is how much emphasis um, the same funders of, or the same interests that are with um, Fox News have put into trying to discredit this source of critique um, and, and in fact how that's taking hold. That's not a criticism of PolitiFact or anyone else. It's just a, it's just a fact that the attacking of that messenger um, has been quite potent uh, so, such that um, you know, uh, someone says Soros and that's it. Uh, a whole set of people turn their ears off even if the other entities are funded by the Cokes and the Scafes and the Bradleys and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Time for one more question. When did it become fashionable for reporters to interview other reporters and call it news? <laughs> I'm not sure when it became fashionable, uh, but it certainly paralleled the rise of cable television because you had you know, the emergence of 24-hour cable news channels, you have a lot of airtime to fill, uh, real reporting is expensive and time consuming. Uh, and so, you know, really arguably you had a whole new uh, professional role that didn't, you know, a role for professional journalists that didn't exist before, uh, you know, who got to become pundits uh, and legal analysts and political analysts, et cetera, uh, or at least Moonlight doing that even as they, you know, had day jobs at the Post or the Times or any other outlet. I think the win was the McLaughlin group. You know, did anybody remember watching that? You know, Morton! And uh, they <laughs> would, uh, it was uh, the point with uh, Charlie McDowell and um, sort of the first TV pundits. Um, pardon me? Washington Week. And Washington Week in Review. And of course, you know, I guess you go back to meet the press. Uh, but um, I, I think, I'm, I'm not sure that's a bad thing in that I do think that uh, journalists as guests, whether on NPR or uh, cable television or uh, meet the press, bring a independent perspective a lot of times that is helpful and they're able to bring expertise on an issue. You talk to bookers, they'll tell you they love to book journalists because they can concisely explain something and they do bring some independence. So I'm not sure that's a bad thing. I, you know, there, um, there are... Um, I, I'm, I think we're all in sync about the need for more accountab accountability journalism by more journalists. And that's all something uh, that I think we all agree is needed. But I'm not, I, I don't, it doesn't trouble me that much that journalists are in a different media talking about their work. I think they do bring uh, some good independent observations to that. Okay. Thank you for your questions. This has been a great conversation, and I'd like to thank our panelists for participating. Just thank you for what a great start to our conversation about uh, money, media, and power.